Hi Vincent, hi Fabrice, good morning everyone. Welcome to this Copernicus Marine Service training workshop dedicated to the Arctic Ocean. My name is Ergen Fouché, I work at Noveltis and I will be animating this session with Fabrice. Hi Fabrice. Hi Ergen, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, and you? Fine. Uh, so my name is Fabrice Messal, I work at Mercator Ocean International as UX and Capacity Development Manager. And uh, with Erkan, I will be your host. Welcome. <laughs> um, so this workshop is divided into three sessions. Today is the first session, and it's dedicated to uh, products and user testimonies. Tomorrow, we're having the second session uh, with practical session. And finally, on April 28, we're going to have the debriefing session in which all the experts will come back for you to ask them questions. Um, maybe we can switch, uh, Fabrice, to the next uh, slide. Mm -hmm. So all the material that has been developed for this workshop is available on the Padlet. You will find the link to the Padlet on the chat. Someone should uh, send the link. Um, so you can find um, in the first section, you will have the where are you from window. Uh, and if you click on it, you'll be able to pin your location and tell us where you're from. And tomorrow we're going to have a look at uh, all your locations and see where, where you're all from. So you will have access from the Padlet to the e-learning material to plenty of videos about the Copernicus Marine Service and the material we have uh, developed for the workshop on the Arctic Ocean. So that's it for the Padlet. Um, so we are on Zoom. You can use the chat for the small talk or to ask some questions, but uh, most of the questions we would like you to ask them on Slido, uh, which is the platform that we use uh, for the questions related to the workshop. The link to the Slido will be sent in the chat as well. Um, and so here is the program of today's session. So right now we're having the welcome and agenda presentation. Right after this presentation, Fabrice is going to introduce you to the Copernicus Marine Service. And we're going to have some presentation of the products from the Copernicus experts. So we're going to have satellite in situ and model products overviews. We are going to have then two user testimonies for you to see how the Copernicus Marine Service products can be used. Then Cedric is going to present you the user corner and the e-learning material available. And finally, we'll have a look at uh, to tomorrow's program, sorry, um, about the practical session. At the end of the workshop, if you have time, the experts uh, will stay with us uh, for you to ask questions uh, and so you'll be able to ask them live questions to switch on your mic and video to talk with them so if you have time do not hesitate to stay with us um, you'll be able to reach the the experts so that's it for the agenda i will now leave the floor to fabrice who is going to present you the copernicus marine service Okay, thank you again so uh, a quick overview of the uh, copernicus marine service so eight years ago, the European Union launched the Copernicus program. Uh, the objective of the program is to develop and implement uh, an operational Earth observation program for Europe based on in situ and satellite uh, measures. Uh, six services uh, give a free and open access to all the Earth observation data produced by the program. And for the Marine Environment Monitoring Service, Mercator Ocean International manage uh, a network of producers observation data providers, monitoring and forecasting centers. So on the Copernicus uh, Marine uh, Service uh, website, uh, you will have information and data uh, for the blue ocean, what we call the blue ocean, uh, the physical state of the ocean, uh, the white ocean, sea ice parameters, and the green ocean, the biogeochemical parameters. 
So the key things to have in mind about the Copernicus Mining Service are there is a, a one single access point for all the data via the web portal, so uh, marine.copernicus.eu. And with a simple registration, you can access the free catalog of products. Uh, all the data are scientifically validated and qualified. Our data are harmonized, which is very uh, uh, simple to uh, compare or to, uh, to play with. Uh, they have the same format, the NetCDF format. And we have a user-driven approach. It means that the evolution of the service uh, takes into account the user requirements. Concerning the products, uh, the Copernicus Marine Service offers a large range of data. It comes from different sources, a model, in situ, satellite. It covers seven areas and different temporal scales with different uh, rates of updates. With all these different sources, different special and temporal coverages, the data catalog of Copernicus Marine Service fits the needs of all users. We provide products, but, but not, uh, we are more than a, a data provider because you will find a different level of information related to this data. The Ocean State Report, for example, uh, which provides each year a comprehensive and state-of-the-art report on the current state, uh, natural variation, and ongoing changes uh, in the ocean. The Ocean Monitoring Indicators, which are key variables used to track the uh, vital health signs of the ocean. And we provide visualization tools that allow visitors uh, at different user levels to dive into our digital oceans and explore all the data. The idea behind the Copernicus Marine Service is to serve uh, all the blue markets so the 12 blue markets are grouped uh, in three pillars of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, environment, society, and economy. Uh, we can find on our portal specific content, which gives you an overview of the usefulness of our data for each blue market. The Copernicus Mind Service provides a tailored user experience with training session, uh, e-learning material, and a strong user support. Cédric uh, will tell you more about in a few minutes. And for example, uh, for those who are interested in artificial intelligence and Earth observation, you can find uh, prod our product on the artificial intelligence Earth observation MOOC on the Wikio platform. Please get in touch via our social media networks to be informed of our new events, publications, and product releases. You can join our marine community on Twitter. We are around 10,000. All tutorial videos and replays of our events are available on our YouTube channel. Thank you. We can hear you again sorry sorry thank you fabrice <laughs> uh, so now that we we know more about the copernicus marine service we can uh, begin our products overview so we're going to have three copernicus marine service experts who are going to present us um, an overview on their product so we're starting with cecily vetre from the norwegian meteorological institute and she's going to present us the satellite observation products. Hi, Cecily. Thank you Hello. very much for being here. Can you share your screen? Yes. Thank you very much. So is, um, is that in the presentation mode now? Yes. Okay, yes. very good. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm Cecilia Vetra. I'm a leader of the CI's Thematic Assembly Center, which means basically um, where we put together products based on observations, and in our case, it's uh, satellite observations. So um, I'd like to tell you uh, first uh, briefly a little bit about the CI's tech. We are quite a few partners. Uh, from many different countries in Europe. We have the Alfred Wegener Institute from Germany, British Antarctic Survey from the UK, 
Danish uh, Technical University, the Nansen Environmental and Remote Sensing Center for Norway, Danish Meteorological Institute, Norwegian Meteorological Institute, Ifremer from France, and the Finnish Meteorological Institute. So all in all, uh, with all our partners and different products, we provide an extensive insight into the state of the Arctic. We also provide uh, products for the global ocean, uh, Arctic, Antarctic, and uh, the Baltic Sea. We have access to more than 40 years of satellite monitoring, which means that we are able to provide climate mon monitoring as well as long-term trends in general. We uh, give support to the national ice services so that they can provide their high resolution ice charts. Uh, our products can be used for data assimilation and validation of ocean forecast models. And there are many, many other uses such as uh, disaster mitigation, contingency management, environmental planning and management, and uh, simply uh, putting down government policies. So what we like to think is that we, we uh, take uh, what we have of cutting edge research and manage to make it operational and available as high quality products to support marine users. Um, so one of our uh, main products are the Arctic high resolution ice charts. These are high resolution charts covering uh, at the moment uh, in, in high detail, the Svalbard um, and Greenland regions. So um, we have access to and we distribute the national ice services ice charts, which are uh, manually adjusted and updated on weekdays. Uh, we format these to CMEM standards, which means uh, for the ice charts that we uh, managed to provide them in a net CDF format. And this is a very important product for all sorts of maritime activities, tactical ship navigation, icebreakers, and, and Arctic research. And uh, here's just a, an, another example of the fine detail where we have an automated ice chart for the Greenland region we are able to uh, distinguish many different types of uh, ice. Um, so that goes from just a little bit of ice on the water, first year ice, second year ice, multi year ice, and all the way to fast ice. Um, another popular pro product is the uh, icebergs uh, in Greenland waters. Uh, we provide two different types of iceberg uh, data sets. One is an iceberg concentration, which is provided on a regular 10 kilometer grid size. And the other is point-based iceberg observations. And these are provided uh, as shape files. So that means that uh, we are able to give the individual positions of uh, all the uh, detected icebergs. So for this product, as well as for many other of our products, we, we depend heavily on Sentinel-1 uh, satellite data, uh, synthetic aperture radar. Uh, data or SAR data. Um, we have one product which is basically used for um, ice charts and automatic ice type classifications. Uh, this is what we call a level three product uh, where we have uh, Sentinel-1 SAR images which are calibrated to provide sigma naught uh, and they are also thermally uh, noise corrected. Uh, we provide these in HH polarization and HV polarization. These form the one of the basis for um, being able to make um, the product that we call sea ice type. So we have um, an Arctic high resolution sea ice concentration and ice type product, which we introduced last year. Um, for the sea ice concentration at the moment, we combine two different types of uh, satellite sensor. Uh, passive microwave radiometer data, as well as, as, well as the SAR data, uh, and managed to make then a product called um, CS concentration. Uh, and then the CS type at the moment only uses the, the SAR data. Um, so, so here are a couple of uh, examples showing this, and these are important for uh, assimilation into ocean forecast models. So we see at the lower bottom right there, an example of the automatic ice chart where we are able to distinguish between open water, Nila's, young ice, 
um, multi-year eyes, and so on. Then we have, um, from the Danish Met Institute, we have the Arctic sea surface and ice surface temperature. Uh, as we all know, the Arctic marine environment is an undergoing a, a, a significant transition from thick multi-year to first year earth cover. Um, and this product is important for monitoring such ongoing changes in the Arctic. So our uh, near real-time product uh, contains a daily field with um, 0.05 degrees resolution. And this covers the surface temperatures both in the ocean and the sea ice, as well as the marginal ice zone. So we have, uh, we, we try to use all available data streams. So recently we have included data streams from Sentinel-3 um, this means data from the um, SLSDR, which is a high accuracy infrared ready augmenter. And also very recently, uh, as of last year, we have uh, available, based on this pr product, a reanalyzed multi-year time series of um, sea surface and ice surface temperature. We also have, of course, CS drift, which is an important parameter. We have a, what we call a global ocean uh, CS drift, um, basically, that means we cover both the northern and southern hemispheres. This is uh, based on SAR data, and we provide this product on a regular 10-kilometer grid. We are also able to derive um, deformation products from the ice drift data. Um, these are such as um, divergence, vorticity, and shear. We, we regularly validate the product uh, by comparing it to high quality positions from in situ drifters. These are GPS equipped ice tethered profilers. So on the right here, we see an example figure where we um, can compare the um, satellite observed CS drift with the um, model computed um, drift. So, um, this is always interesting to compare and uh, we see how important it is for the forecast from the ocean models. Um, I wanted to show an animation. Um, this is from Northern Greenland uh, in the winter of 2018, where we see that um, uh, close to the Northern coast of Greenland, it's generally known for very old, uh, thick uh, land fast ice. And we suddenly saw unprecedented uh, an opening where, where the uh, landfast ice started to, to drift away from the coast, uh, really demonstrated uh, how, how things are changing in the Arctic now. So as I said, this is uh, an important and very useful product. We also have uh, uh, CS thickness in the Arctic. This is based on MERS, Chrysler 2 and SMOS data. So this is merging um, a weekly average sea ice thickness map, uh, which we generate every day in the winter months, and then merge this with a weekly cryosat 2 sea ice product uh, with a daily uh, small sea ice thickness retrieval. Um, so here we see uh, on the left, um, typical example of the sea ice thickness um, in April, uh, a, a weekly mean from 2019. And then we have a CS thickness anomaly uh, on the right here. And very important also is the uh, sea ice in the Baltic Sea. Um, uh, we know that a lot of transportation by ship goes to the Baltic countries, uh, Finland and so on. So it's very important to know how the CS conditions. <laughs> So we have uh, products based on the uh, ice charts generated by the National Ice Service at uh, FMI. Um, but we also have the automatic products which are based on SAR imagery, um, where we have CS thickness, ice drift, and ice thickness uh, mosaic. We see an example on the right there of mosaic. Um, and finally, um, we have an Ar Antarctic ice edge uh, based on SAR data. Uh, this is operational only during the um, Southern Hemisphere summer, um, but it uses as much of the Sentinel-1 A and B um, data that's possible to access. Um, but we have ice experts who have to manually interpret the Sentinel-1 data. They're using um, the geographical information system for this. Uh, we have a nominal grid resolution of one kilometers. So this is mostly used for um, research purposes. 
But um, for this and, and for, for all the other products that we have, it's possible to visualize this using the um, visualization tool on the web portal called MyOcean. My so I'm just on the lower left there, I provide an example of how this would look. So it's quite fun to, to, to play around with, but also use uh, for research. We do re redistribute a uh, global product from the uh, UMITSAT OSI SAF. Um, this is a 10 kilometer resolution product um, providing CS concentration, edge type and drift. So just a few examples there for both. Um, we, we have this for both the Northern and Southern hemisphere. And then we have our multi-year time series. We're, we're still building many of these. We don't have them for all our parameters, but uh, they are continually being added every year. One of our oldest ones are from Ephraim Air. Uh, we have Arctic Sea and Drift. Uh, these are based on a combination of uh, scatterometers and radiometers. Um, then we have a uh, climate data record from the uh, Arctic for CS thickness. It, this is a redistributed uh, product from uh, Copernicus Climate Change Service. This will be extended uh, regularly uh, I think this year. And, and then finally, we, we have the ocean monitoring indicators, which are very useful to see trends in the Arctic as well as the Antarctic. So we have CS extent indicators for both uh, Southern and Northern Hemisphere, where we define the CS extent as an uh, area with a CS concentration of more than 50%. And this is based on our very long 40-year uh, plus uh, series of satellite observations. And, and as I said, we can monitor trends uh, to, to see how, how well the um, ICE is doing on globally. So that's it uh, for the CSAC, a very brief introduction. So um, I'll just say thank you. Thank you very much, Cecily. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, presentation, I think. Well, I found it very interesting. Uh, we've had some questions. Maybe we can take two minutes to answer some of the questions that were asked during your presentation. Um, so in Slido, as you can see, you can upvote the questions. So do not hesitate to upvote the questions you're interested in. So the first one is, what's the minimum size for an iceberg you can monitor? And how much smaller would you like to go? Um, well, I would say that the minimum size is, is comparable to a ship because that's one of the things that we will implement this year is, a, is um, a way to filter out ships so that they are not mistaken for icebergs. So on board all ships there are or should be um, an AIS, which uh, sends, sends signals about where the ship is. So this will be used to say, okay, this is a false observation and so on. So that's, I would say, is more or less the size that we can monitor. Okay, next question. Do you have in-situ observation to validate uh, the satellite sea ice measurements? Um, th this is a very challenging um, thing for us. Uh, as I mentioned for the global sea ice drift, it is compared to floating GPS um, buoys. But in, in general, it's very hard to put uh, instruments out in the uh, Arctic sea ice uh, for long periods of time uh, because it's such harsh environments and it's, it's very difficult to also get to uh, access the instruments and, and do service for them. So that's a constant challenge for us where we have to um, think in new ways to be able to validate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, when you build free analysis multi-year series product, do you apply new processing method on the data or is this just an aggregation of previous products? Well, when doing reanalysis, you, you try to use all the available uh, information and data that you have, which was perhaps not available last time you, you made the, the long time series. So you, you you would always try to reprocess and, and also use the latest methods available. Um, but, but on this, I would say I'm, I'm not an 
expert on exactly how they do it, um, for example, at different meds. So, so but, but I can check how exactly they do it if you would like to have the exact answer. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to keep these questions for the extra session uh, at 4.30. Uh, you'll be able to ask your questions to Cecily um, in live. So we're keeping these questions for after and we're going back to the, the rest of the workshop. Yes, let me share my screen again. So let's continue uh, this workshop with the presentation of uh, Vidarlin from the Institute of Marine Research about in-situ observation products. Vidar, the floor is yours. Thank you. And, um, I will try to share my screen. So hopefully this is uh, working. Hope yes. You can see my presentation. Yes. <clears throat> so my name is uh, Vina Lien, and I will present uh, briefly to you the in situ thematic center part of the Copernicus Marine Service. So I start with um, uh, this uh, as a motivation. This quote from uh, Karl Wunsch that without sufficient observations, useful prediction will likely never be possible because the models can evolve and improve, but we will not be able to validate the models without observations. And also observations not taken today are lost forever. So this is a motivation for doing observations and we should increase the coverage of the ocean. So I will first talk briefly about the uh, in-situ data that we include. Uh, then I will mention briefly the in-situ TAC uh, then I will go into the in situ products we have and say a few words about in situ documentation that we provide. So starting with the ocean, it's big and it's complex. Um, and there's a lot of processes that we are trying to resolve both in the observations and uh, in models uh, to be able to predict the ocean and understand what's going on. Um, so to do that, we need a multi-platform approach. So this is showing some examples of uh, the data that we, or data sources that we include in uh, in situ tech products. So basically, what the in situ tech is doing is that we gather data that are available, and we provide an uh, extra layer of uh, uh, quality control, and then we provide the data through the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, and you can see here, there are a lot of different platforms. Uh, we include the data from vessels, uh, typically CTD data, but now recently also adding ADCP data from vessels. We have gliders, uh, we have surface drifters, we have Argo floats doing profiling, the moorings, uh, and so on. Um, and we are extending these data sets, not only in time, of course, but also with respect to number of platforms and also parameters. And as was said uh, earlier on, this is a user-driven initiative. So when there is demand for new parameters and new platforms, we will do our best to include them in the future. So a few words about the in-situ TAC. Uh, it uh, has already been mentioned, but I really want to highlight this, that we provide multi-source and multi-platform uh, data which are heterogeneous in nature. So the main added value we provide is that all these data are provided in a homogeneous format, which is the NetCDF. So all files will look the same uh, when you download, no matter where they come from, the data come from, whether they come from CTD or uh, HF radar or whatever. Also, any near real-time data sources are provided within 24 hours. And also, uh, we provide a consistent and documented quality control. So we do not know or, or do not have uh, control of where the data are actually coming from, whether there are sensor data, whether it is uh, sample data, which kind of quality control has been performed on the data. So we provide an extra layer of quality control uh, and this is all documented. So all our procedures are transparent. So you can 
go to our website and check out what has been done to the data from our side before we provide them. Also, real-time data undergo automatic quality control before they are provided online. And all the data are free and open, uh, and you can uh, use them as you wish. And also, I would like to highlight that the Copernicus Marine Service has a long-term commitment from the European Commission. So this will not go away. It will not stop in the near future. This will go on uh, and expand also in the future. Then I will talk a bit about uh, our products. This will be a bit more technical, but this is more for your reference when you are uh, digging around in our product and catalogs. Um, so as I said, everything is documented. Uh, so we have a product user manual and we have quality information documents where we provide information on how the data files and what they look like, what is done to the data in terms of quality control and so on. And you can check this on our website. Uh, our product consists uh, mainly of uh, two categories. We have the near real-time data flow, which is updated every hour and data are added within 24 hours, as long as they are available. Of course, in the Arctic, this is typically a challenge, but for instance, CTD data or online mooring systems, they report uh, on a daily basis. We also have what we call reprocessed uh, data, uh, the rep data set. This is updated every six months. And this is going back uh, and we take uh, not only the automatic quality control data, but we take the delayed mode quality control data when data are calibrated and we harvest them again and so on. And then we also perform a more sophisticated quality control of the data. Uh, we monitor them uh, and we look for outliers and so on and visually inspect them. So this is the highest quality uh, data set that we have. And this is what is assimilated into model reanalysis under the Copernicus Marine Service. <coughs> Our data sets uh, are typically divided into topics. Uh, and you can see some example file names uh, that we have uh, uh, products for wave data, for temperature and salinity, and for instance, BGC, uh, biogeochemical data. And in addition to this, we also provide two uh, gridded products, which are then objective analysis uh, on the data provided on a regular grid. Uh, that can be uh, a good addition for some uh, purposes to have it uh, on a regular grid. So this uh, will be similar to uh, World Ocean Atlas, for instance. So here you see uh, address to, to our files. Uh, note that there will be a file name change uh, later this year. So just be aware of that. We also provide index files uh, to ease navigation and search. Uh, and our files are organized based on periods. So there are three categories. If you want only latest data, you can go into the latest catalog. They will always find the last 30 days. If you want data on a monthly basis, you can go into the monthly folder and here you will find last five years of data uh, on a monthly basis. And then we have what we call history, which is all the data we have. And here you will find one file per platform uh, since the beginning of that uh, platform reporting. And this is what it looks like. Uh, it's a bit uh, technical, but um, you can see we have uh, what we call the ARC multi-parameter in real time, and he will find, as I said, the latest, which is one file per day per platform. Then you have on a monthly basis, one file again per month per platform. And then in the history, you have one file per platform. Platform can be a ship. So if you go into the history and look for a certain ship, you will find all the CTD data from that ship uh, since we started harvesting. And you can see uh, at the lower, panel here, you see a lot of abbreviations, uh, and I will come into this on this next slide. This is how uh, the data or product is uh, organized. So all data files uh, have names like this uh, with uh, some uh, character symbols, uh, where the first two characters is a region. So for the Arctic, all Arctic files will start with AR uh, for the Arctic. And then you have the file type, whether you are looking for a time series or profile data, uh, or you're looking at 
for wave data, for instance, or velocity data. Uh, and then the last uh, uh, two uh, character code is the data type. Uh, here it is divided into, for instance, profiling floats, gliders, and you have CTDs, bottle data, ferry box data. So this is what you will look, uh, what you want to look for if you are looking for specific data. And then there's a code describing uh, the platform name, and that could be a, a ship code uh, or whatever. So this is how the data is organized when you are searching for it in our catalog. Then I will say a few words about uh, documentation, because as I said, everything is documented and transparent. Uh, one way of documenting it uh, is you can go to the in-situ dashboard uh, and you can see the web address up in the right corner. Uh, this will give you a quick overview of what is available. Um, and you can see on screen uh, there are tracks uh, and uh, points where data are available for a certain uh, period. And you also get an overview of how much data there is, uh, how many data providers, how many platforms. And here you can also see the service availability. Uh, and you can see that it's 99.9%. So virtually all the time this is uh, up and running. Uh, if we zoom into the Arctic uh, region, there's uh, less data, of course, uh, but still uh, we have uh, several hundred active platforms. And again, the service availability is very high. And as you can see on the left side here, you can uh, uh, look for data uh, and you can also click on the screen uh, to get one example here. Um, here we have clicked on the profile, so it uh, tells you which parameters are available and you can download data or view data directly on screen. And then you can go into the catalog uh, on the web to, to download the data via FTP afterwards. Uh, more on documentation, uh, you can go to our website to find uh, all the documents and uh, document what we are doing, like system requirement documents, the product user manual, and also the parameters list uh, where you can see uh, which parameters are available. Uh, not all parameters uh, that you can think of are available. Again, this is user driven. So if it is important parameters that you cannot find, you can uh, request it and uh, we can see if in the future we can add these uh, parameters. You can also look into the quality control procedures, what is done. And there's also some useful code uh, that you can find on the webpage. We also keep track of key performance indicators. Here you can check uh, whether the products are delayed or if they are on time, the number of platforms provided, data providers, and how many files are available and so on. So this was uh, very quick and a bit technical, um, but uh, this was just to give you an overview of uh, wh what kind of data we have and what it looks like. Uh, and then I'm um, Please to take your questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Vidar. I think we have, uh, yes, we have a lot of questions for you on the on Slido. Let's check. I would open my camera. Yeah. So, uh, first question: Are the river observations in the in situ tag? the source of the assimilated river observations in the reanalysis whoop, product. As far as I know, we don't have uh, river observations uh, directly. Uh, no, and this is not uh, included uh, okay. as far as I know. Thank you. So the second question is, what are the options for sensors on floating ice? The map showed before seems to limit sensors to areas where ice is at least non-multi-seasonal. Um, this is a good question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not uh, an expert on uh, CS observations. So I know that we don't have um, CS uh, sensors included as of yet at least. So uh, I think I will have to pass this to uh, other experts on uh, CS observation, in situ CS observation. 
Okay, thank you. Just for your information, we're going to gather all the questions and provide you with uh, all the answers uh, after the workshop. So you, even if the, un the question is not answered today, you will find your answer later. So we continue the presentation again? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, and so we're going to welcome our last expert to present the, um, the products. We're going to welcome Laurent Bertineau from the Nansen Environmental and Remote Sensing Center. And he's going to present us the model products from the Copernicus Marine Service. Hi, Laurent. Thank Hello you again. for being you. here. Yeah. You see my slide? Yes. Okay. So I'm Laurent Bertineau, I'm in Bergen, just like the previous two speakers. And um, I'm going to uh, show you a brief uh, run through the, the models we have in the Monitoring and Forecasting Center, Arctic MFC. So first, uh, short introduction to the partners of this uh, consortium. So at the Lensa Center, we have uh, three um, expertise for the biogeochemistry models, physical models, CIS models, and uh, the lead of the Arctic MFC, Norwegian Meteorology Institute on the second line has experts of physics, ice, waves, and has, as well uh, the local service desk, the technical responsibility and product quality responsibility. Uh, Vidar at the uh, Institute of Marine Research has expertise in physical oceanography and is also in charge of the uh, contributions to the Ocean State Report. And we have the Danish Meteorological Institute as a partner for uh, ocean modeling and sea ice modeling as well. So in terms of uh, products, so we have blue ocean products with a uh, ocean model HICOM which is an uh, say, uh, advanced hybrid coordinate uh, modeling system. And it is coupled to a CIS model. So at present, we are using the CIS version 3, but we're working on upgrading this uh, CIS model to the uh, version 5. And eventually, we would like to replace the CIS model size with a uh, next generation CIS model, NextSim, which I will show you a little later. And the section to the right is uh, showing what uh, the uh, vertical coordinate system can do to separate warm and cold waters in, uh, in one of the seals to the Arctic. Um, the next slide is showing what the resolution is uh, at present with a, say, a little snippet of the, the model domain around Svalbard. So uh, for those of you who recognize Svalbard, it is hard to recognize, but this is this uh, say, archipelago uh, uh, to the, the east of uh, Greenland. So uh, our Topaz 2, uh, Topaz 4, sorry, uh, modeling system is having a 12 kilometer resolution. Uh, we are running 100 members of this model for the implementation of the ensemble command filter. And this allows us to assimilate different uh, type of satellite data. So sea level, SST, which have not been uh, said before, but also CIS concentration from uh, massive microwave, CIS thickness shown earlier, and CIS drift. And the same uh, assimilation method also assimilates institute temperature and salinity profiles from the Argo buoys, from the ice tilt profilers, so there's data inside the sea ice, uh, so uh, attached to the under the ice that uh, are assimilated in real time. They're also as, uh, present in the institute tech, which we uh, presented earlier. And the system provides both a forecast and a real analysis uh, product. Now we're working on the uh, preparation of this Topaz 5 uh, configuration with a double resolution and the same uh, data simulation uh, that, um, system. And we want to have that in operations in April next year. And we're doing good, good progress on that. The, uh, the, uh, the biases of the previous modeling system seem to be uh, in good part resolved. And there's also a Tobias 6 system with three kilometer resolution. And that one is already running in the real time with one member. It doesn't have any assimilation, but it does provide tides and storm surges. So that's already a product uh, for the past two years. And all the, the models, ocean models are validated and uh, the other models as well, uh, we'll show you later. Uh, and there's an internal web page. If you have the slides, you will be able to click on this link here and see all of the uh, uh, forecast uh, validation results. And now to come back to this uh, plot of the Svalbard, this is how it looks with a six kilometer resolution and a three kilometer resolution. And now you can finally recognize Svalbard. So uh, the next thing is the uh, sea ice modeling for the white ocean, in which we, which is present in the, in the uh, ocean model, as I said before. There's also a standalone sea ice model that only forecasts the sea ice. And that's running on a triangular uh, mesh. Uh, mesh is 10 kilometer uh, size, but we provide the output on interpolated to a square grid of three kilometers. That uh, sort of renders uh, better the uh, sort of 
adaptive uh, mesh uh, uh, resolution. And then you see that the, the model is resolving a lot of the cracks in the, in the CIs. It has uh, the, the latest uh, rheology model from uh, uh, Anna Rolasson and co-authors, the Brittle Bingham Maxwell rheology. And in terms of data simulation, this is more rudimentary. It is uh, nudged to CS concentrations from SSMI and AMSOL2. And it will also uh, include CIS thickness assimilation uh, uh, next year. Um, so uh, the work on coupling to the ocean is also an ongoing work, but it's not there yet. That's why we cannot do it in, uh, in real time. This TOPA 6 uh, three kilometer model I mentioned earlier is providing tidal and storm surge uh, modeling, and it's uh, validated against uh, a number of tide gauges, uh, historical tide, ga tide gauges. And there you can see uh, what the co tidal chart looks like in this model. It has the amphidromes and all of what the tidal model should have. Uh, the next chapter is the green ocean with the biogeochemical model products. So we have two products, uh, an operational product with a simple data simulation and reanalysis with an advanced uh, ensemble cannon smoother. And you see that the uh, uh, ECOSMO uh, model, ecosystem model, has uh, say, a large number of, uh, of um, uh, compartments with uh, different phytoplankton and uh, zooplankton and, uh, and nutrients. So that's uh, the model that is run both in real time and in reanalysis but with different uh, configurations. And the variables uh, included in there are all uh, provided to CMEMS, but they have different, say, uh, var degrees of confidence as I, they are listed from top to bottom. The, the confidence is, uh, is decreasing, so we have better confidence in nutrients than in zooplankton biomass, for example. And uh, not, uh, no, we don't have validation numbers for all of them, but for the nutrients, the, there are uh, data available from the Institute TAC. Uh, the next uh, chapter is the waves. And um, this is uh, a plot of the uh, wave hindcast, uh, which is provided by the, the one model, by uh, Norwegian Met Office at three kilometer resolution. And um, it has, say, all of the technical uh, properties you see here. Um, in the uh, graphic, you see that it's, uh, it is fed from two different inputs. There's the ERA-5 winds over the whole Arctic. But there's, uh, say, uh, a boosting of the ERA-5 with a downscaling of the winds uh, around uh, Norway and Scandinavia. And it's done by the AROM uh, three-kilometer uh, weather model. And uh, it, the output is hourly and um, makes a lot of data. The INCAS covers the year 1992 to present, uh, to 2020. That would be uh, what it will do at the end of this year. Uh, and there is a forecast model that now, uh, since 4th of April, since a couple of weeks ago, provides uh, this exactly the same model configuration uh, with different uh, frequencies, but the, the code is the same and the parameterizations are the same. It has also wave propagation under the eyes, and uh, it provides forecast twice a day. And it does feed also from currents and sea ice from the, the ocean model. So uh, with uh, having said all of that, that's uh, the overview of the forecast products. So um, there's uh, five of them to the top with the ocean, sea ice, and uh, waves. And the multi-year products of the long reanalysis, there's only three of them, uh, but we are going to increase that in the future. And uh, the plan is that by the end of this three years contract, we'll have uh, more multi-year products with an extra multi-year Nexim uh, Hindcast, and as well a long multi-year product with a product spanning a longer period of time. So from the 50s or from the 80s. Um, but we'll come back to that uh, when the, the, these products will be available by we'll receive emails about that. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Laurent, uh, I can see we've had some questions. Yes. Well, many questions uh, for you. Um, okay, first question from Ingrid. Uh, can one get the 3D velocity fields from all Topaz versions directly on your server? Not all versions. There is one, uh, say, standard product for the, the 3D currents, which is the product that is assimilating all the data, and that's Topaz 4 at 12 kilometers. And the Topaz 6 uh, at 
three kilometers only provides the surface data. So the surface currents and sea surface heights. And uh, once the Topaz 5 will be operational, it will replace uh, Topaz 4. So it, uh, the resolution will go from 12 to six kilometer resolution. And there will be a sort of double diffusion period in which during two months, you will have the two products in parallel. Okay, thank you, Laura. So the next question is, is there a damping effect or real coupling between waves and sea ice? It's a damping effect only. So it means the, uh, ampli the waves are propagating below the ice and depending on the ice concentration and thickness, their ampli um, amplitude will be attenuated progressively as it goes into the sea ice. But the real coupling, which means the breaking of ice by the waves, uh, which also sort of uh, enhance the attenuation of waves, that coupling is, uh, is too costly to put in an operational system. It's only used in a research mode so far. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for a last question? Yes. Yeah? Can we cl classify phytoplankton further in the atom, etc.? Please elaborate with methodology. Yeah, so there's uh, two classes of uh, uh, phytoplankton in Ecosmo at present. There's, uh, by size, there's flagellates, which are everything that is not diatoms and diatoms. And uh, by the end of next year, we plan to include an, another class, the coccolithophores, which is uh, say, important uh, in, the, in the Arctic because of their, uh, say, uh, special biology. Um, the methodology, well, the, uh, it is um, uh, every time you include a new class of uh, plankton uh, or, uh, say, different compartments in an ecosystem model, you, that incurs a lot of uh, computational costs because this compartment needs to be advected, and it's, uh, it means that uh, you have to be quite conservative in the number of classes we put in an ecosystem model. We have a lot of high-level questions today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another question, how realistic is the number of leads uh, opened in your CIS model? Yeah, you cannot validate the number of leads, but what you can validate is the deformation rates. And um, the deformations of the ice uh, happen on multiple scales. So there's large deformations, small deformations, and they, um, uh, you can split them into uh, convergence, divergence, uh, vorticity, and um, shear. And these scaling laws of deformations is what has been verified for the CS model next in. And th that seems to perform quite well. I can send you publications if you send a, want to see that. Thank you, Laurent. Last one. <laughs> okay. Ergan, you want okay. to ask uh, the Is the delivered fresh water from glaciers and GRIS, sorry, included yeah. in Topaz 4? Yeah, the green ice sheet. So that's uh, okay. estimates <laughs> of. Uh, the mass loss of Greenland uh, by gravity, uh, set, uh, uh, ultimate, uh, gra gravity satellites. Uh, so that's been included in the Topaz 4 reanalysis. So the one that has been uh, posted on the, uh, the server last December. But uh, the Topaz 4 real-time forecast does not have it. Uh, it will be included in the Topaz 5 forecast. That's, uh, okay. that's the same. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, so just like for the other lecturers, the rest of the questions will be answered in the extra session after the, after, well, at three, four and a half, sorry. Okay. Oops. No, no, I have a problem to kit the presentation. Sorry for that. Um, where am I? Sorry. <laughs> I just kit all my uh, presentation. Um, oh. Okay. So I think we, uh, we have to jump to the uh, user testimony now. No? Yes, that's it. Yes. That's Do you it. want me to show my screen? Let me find it. Yeah, 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 I have mine. It's, it's, it's all good. 
Uh, user testing money, sorry for that. Oh, it's never the, the I press always the, the, the wrong button, sorry for that. Um, but after the, this, uh, the, 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 the presentation of uh, uh, Cecilia Vidar and, and, uh, and Laurent, we didn't lie you. We have the, the biggest experts uh, at the Copernicus Marine Service. So now it's the turn of uh, Lasse Raverstein to uh, present the drift and noise uh, service, a, a, a service made by drift and noise. The floor is yours, Lasse. Hello, can you hear me now? I unmuted myself. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So then I share my screen. You cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Um, sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> to stop sharing my screen, but I don't see. Just like, uh, yeah, we're having some problem <laughs> with <laughs> the Zoom <laughs> today. Is there uh, the red button stop share somewhere? Um, I wish I could find it. Oh, yes, there it is. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Now I can share. Okay. Do you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. I'm bold enough to share the entire screen. Hopefully, no <laughs> message intrudes. Uh, yeah. So um, um, I have the honor to present uh, a use case. And uh, we are probably a good example of uh, people started their own business uh, from academia. So all the founders of our company were formerly academics in university or research institutes. But uh, since, um, thanks to Copernicus, the data provision uh, is so well nowadays that uh, we started the consulting business first. We called it Drift and Noise Polar Services, and we are actually a spin-off of the German Alfred Wigner Institute for Polar and Marine Research. Um, this is our present team. Um, some of us are uh, like sea ice experts, like myself, and others are more software engineers, because over the last six years, sometimes it's unbelievable for me to believe that we already manage uh, uh, to stay in business for six years now and we're actually growing we started with two persons now we are seven not all of them are listed here because we actually has also, also have uh, positions open now so who here in the audience knows or is uh, familiar with front-end developing web developing we definitely have a job offer for you um but <clears throat> so what are we doing um my, myself i'm I, I, once I could consider myself as a CIS expert, would say, but no, um, maybe I'm still an SCIS expert, although I'm not doing academics. Uh, but uh, what we're doing is we go on chips, um, like the most prominent example, maybe you have heard about an expedition taking uh, place in February, March this year, uh, a British expedition on the South African research icebreaker, Gallus 2, where... Um, we supported the ship navigating through the Antarctic sea ice, and eventually they found the wreck of Ernest Shackleton's uh, ship Endurance. And uh, we also saw this as a, a great um, use case of where all these data, satellite images, and also ocean and ice information available nowadays can help such a uh, complex um, expedition here you see that we could even navigate in the night uh, and during snowfall thanks to the ice information and satellite images we had. Uh, what we did for example we established uh, a GIS QJS experiment on the bridge and we included several data sources um, so Sentinel-1 satellite images for example or even higher resolution satellite images from, um, from the Terrasar X mission or we also got support from uh, the Finnish startup IceEye, which they provide even higher resolution radar images. But here in green and yellow, you also see ice drift forecasts um, because we um, supported uh, as well uh, in, uh, autonomous underwater vehicle operation. Uh, and during this, the ship had to stand still 
And uh, the drift direction of the ship as the platform for the underwater vehicle was very important. So here the drift direction uh, forecast was very, very important. And on the radar image as well, uh, you see these open leads in the ice cover, which uh, served as um, yeah, like highways for the icebreaker. And one job we, for example, also had on board is here you see in red the track of the ship. And it looks like we went through the ice flow here, uh, but indeed we went through this uh, open lead. But you see that this is um, already the, mm, the ice drift, um, the hourly and daily, the continuous ice drift. So one uh, job we had to do is to adjust the satellite imagery permanently and continuously for ice drift to have a real-time image which we could use for tactical navigation. Um, yeah, so I mentioned we also are software engineers in our team. And uh, we um, also used uh, a software, an application, which we uh, developed on our own. And actually, uh, yeah, so it's called ICC. You see a logo here, but I, I see, I, I show you more images soon, um, which eventually should automate away our own presence on the ships on the bridge of icebreakers. And here we are more in the, uh, in the uh, we act more as an intermediate user, I would say, because we produce a software which access all the data which were uh, introduced also in the last three presentations to, um, to design the application for an end user in the nautical business. Um, all this started in a, 2019 in a Copernicus Marine Service user uptake project, which we did together with the Meteorological Institute in Norway, uh, more specifically with Malte Müller and Cyril Palerm from the Development Center for Weather Forecasting. And uh, the data we initially used for the ICC application uh, is uh, listed here. So it's the Arctic Ocean Physics Analysis and Forecast Model, which is the TOPAS 12 kilometer resolution model uh, Laurent just introduced in the previous talk. And uh, then the global ocean sea ice concentration, ice, ice edge type. So all kind of different lower resolution ice information. And of course, uh, as the backbone of every operational information in ice, we use Sentinel-1 uh, ZAR images. Uh, here you see, before I show you the application in action, you see uh, sketch of the data flow. So this is what's happening on the Metno side. They um, improve for Svalbard, uh, the Topaz 4 based ice drift forecasts. They're using uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms here uh, and to minimize uh, um, uh, non-random errors in the forecast. So as far as I understood it, but if you have more detailed questions, I would refer to Malta or Cyril here. And then we uh, grab these ice drift forecasts information similar to the Topaz 4 forecasts and include them into our, uh, into our apps. And we convert it also into ice drift trajectories so that the user can indeed see where a certain ice flow will be in one, two, or three days into the future. Uh, we also identified some user needs on board ships. So uh, the first and most important user need probably is a, a low bandwidth uh, data transmission. Uh, so a lot of, of nowadays map-based information tools do not work on ships because you have uh, a bandwidth which uh, are more like being back in the 90s or so. And uh, it should be easily installed and easily uh, working on several platforms. So what we came up with finally is uh, a progressive web app technology. So that's it's an app delivered via via the internet. Do you see um, the app screen now? So I can zoom in and zoom out here. If you open our app in the browser, I give you the uh, URL. Uh, after my presentation here on the slide, um, you can immediately install it via the browser bar, at least if you use a modern browser. And here, for example, at the example uh, uh, of Svalbard, where we display the CS concentration, this is updated 
even eight times a day because we access the SWAS data from the Japanese Space Agency directly. You see the ice drift as trajectories. Uh, this is the ice drift provided by, by METNO. So you see in red the first day, and then each point is one day into the future. We found that this is a more intuitive way for, for decision makers on, on a bridge to, to determine the current momentum of, of the ice uh, drift. And then, of course, if you are interested in a certain area, let's say here north of Svalbard, then you can download a low-resolution radar image from Sentinel-1, which is about 30 kilobytes only. And if you are, you can also display your position here. Um, if you want a full-resolution radar image, then you can also download that one, which is about 2 megabytes. You can display the age of the image. For example, this one is six hours old. And uh, yeah, so we continuously updating uh, the the app, and uh, so it's it's like every one, two, or three months we have an update. Uh, so it's not like a, a static software, but it's more a service we deliver via the application. And yeah, eventually we hope that at some point the job we have done on the Agalis two to find the wreck of the endurance, for example that the most important features of this manual work are included in the app. Um, yeah, and of course, it's also uh, a race with innovation. I mean, when I, when every time I see uh, like the new products of CMEMS and other data providers, it really keeps us busy to, to integrate even the newest products into an app like this, which is, which is a complicated process. We also learned uh, over the course of the last six years that Programming for academic purposes is is another thing than um, maintaining an application which runs on several platforms. So even a small button or a small data um, feed you want to integrate into the app can take weeks and months of development. Um, so I go back to presenter mode here. The users we have so far are from fishery. Uh, for example, we have uh, some Canadian fishery company uh, yeah, making uh, use of, of the ICC app. We have a lot of expedition crews, uh, vessels. We have research ships using our app. And also we had some uh, cargo companies uh, going through the Northern Sea Route, for example, to add the information level they have on board with the app. Um, Oh, yeah, here you see an animation which Alexandra Stocker and our team did for Svalbard, where she, uh, in green, I think you see the fishery activity, and in red, you see the seasonal expedition cruise activity. And yeah, okay. Yeah, that was um, already the most important things I wanted to show you. And I haven't, I think I'm good in time. I'm even ahead of schedule. Um, so yeah, I think what you can take home here is, maybe I should show you that one. Yeah, if you want to try our app, you can go and open this URL, and then you can register uh, with an email, and then you will be sent a token to that to an email, and then you can use uh, the ICC app on your own devices, smartphone or tablet or on your laptop. And um, if uh, you are maybe in the same position as we are and you're interested in including CMEMS data and other data into an app or your own software, we are also open to talk to you, to exchange information, problems we had, exchange ideas and so on. So we are always open for cooperation and we also uh, like open source communities and we have no problem to share source code we have and so on. I just wanted to to make this clear here in this context. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lasse. Um, it's been a very interesting presentation and I can see plenty of uh, comments saying that it's, it's a nice app. Um, I think we've had some questions. Yes. The uh, first one, well, yeah, yeah, Fabrice, you can read the first one. Uh, yeah, uh, we did not write a paper on that. Okay, sorry, you want to read out? Read yeah, how difficult is jumping from academia to business? Any upcoming paper on that topic? Uh, no. They, <laughs> so the, the first thing is you don't need to write papers any longer if you jump from <laughs> academic to, <laughs> to business. Um, 
Uh, I would say it is for me personally. It is uh, was more uh, as a harder thing as was to accept that you um, you are not working in academics any longer. It's more uh, and uh, like how much do you identify yourself with your job? And it needed for me to take a while to uh, understand that you can still be a scientist, although you're not working in academia or with your own service. Um, so, but in that sense, I think it was not too hard um, because there are a lot of programs available to do that step. So, for example, when I decided to move from academia to business, uh, I was at ETH Zurich. And ETH Zurich, for example, has a lot of technology transfer programs. Then we also got support from... Uh, from CMEMS, from the user uptake project, which is, uh, was a very, very good start to, uh, to realize an idea you had, or maybe even developed with an academia, but you want to, to go out to make a business or start a business with it. So uh, yeah, go out to and, and look for programs which support you. We also got support by the ESA Business Incubation Program, which I can also recommend here. And they, uh, you can also, uh, Go there and uh, you get seminars and teaching about entrepreneurship and so on, especially for academics. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the, next qu the next question is, um, all the features of the app are free? Uh, no. Um, so because we uh, <laughs> started the business, of course, yeah, we need to, to think about our funding. Sure. So, so, so far, um, we are to one third funded by state programs uh, like ESA programs or national funding. And to two thirds, we need to, to make a revenue with, with our of users. Course. And uh, so we have a lot of features, AFRI, CS concentration, iStrift, for example, etc. Of course, all of this provided by Metno here. But uh, some data, and we also have to, to make as a pay product but we uh, don't target really individual users. So if you as an individual user, if you're interested in using a certain feature, just contact me and we can unlock it for you because our business model is targeting governmental institutions or, or larger businesses to pay for all their clients or customers. Um, so that's the business model we have behind because there are of course not million of users which can pay only one euro, mm -hmm. but there's probably, uh, yeah, there's only a few users uh, in the Arctic, of course. Okay. okay. We have time for the yes, last question. The last one. Yeah. How did you find the endurance? Uh, yeah, by <laughs> um, so we had a we had a search window um, by uh, Frank Frank Worsley was the captain of the endurance, and he um, had two positions before and after the endurance sink. And so by taking into account the accuracy of these sextant measurements and by considering the past ice drift, and actually we used ERA-20 ECMWF uh, weather data to, um, to simulate the ice drift from 1915 when the endurance sank. And it was not so bad and quite in good agreement with what the meteorologist, meteorologist on board the endurance uh, recorded for weather uh, directions. And then we, um, we had a search window of eight to 15 nautical miles. And then a, um, a company called Ocean Infinity who are experts in ocean, um, in deep sea surveying, they used a, a saber tooth, a sharp saber tooth underwater vehicle to scan the ocean bottom. And it eventually they found it in 3000 meter depths. Great. Okay, great. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe the last question we keep it for the the extra session. We're okay. Going back to the schedule. Okay. And uh, are you able to share your screen, Fabrice? Yes. <laughs> so we will. One <laughs> <laughs> we're going to give the floor to Etienne Sayuk, uh, who works at Novelties with me. And he's going to present us the second user testimony about coastal service dedicated to fishing, aquaculture, and maritime safety, safety sorry, in the Arctic. Hi, Etienne. Hi, Thank Arianne. you for joining us. You can share your screen and start yes. your presentation. Okay. So here you can see my screen, I think. Yes. 
Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the user uptake uh, activities program, which Novartis have been uh, doing during the year of uh, 2018. Uh, this is uh, an operational service to characterize risk indicators related to safety at sea and environmental impacts of human activities uh, on the Arctic region uh, from the north of Norway and uh, to the North Pole. Uh, oh. uh, so this service uh, is operational and is using uh, Copernicus Marine Service products. Um, it is uh, directed towards uh, activities at sea, like transport, fishing, and aquaculture, and renewable energies. And this service is um, aims to, to protect a uh, user of um, the sea economy uh, by providing information about statistical st 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 uh, information uh, about waves, uh, sea ice, and um, noise uh, at sea. Um, so we are using uh, two operational systems. Uh, one from the Quiet Ocean uh, company, which is named Quonops, uh, and which uh, is computing an estimate of spatial temporal distribution of anthropic noise level, which are resulting from uh, human activities. And the other um, model is a downscaling uh, wave model from Novelties uh, using. Uh, all to the, these uh, three products from the Copernicus Marine Service. So we are using Arctic analysis and forecast waves, uh, forecast of physical uh, variables uh, like temperature, um, uh, sp uh, ocean speed, and uh, and salinity, and uh, the product of Arctic Ocean uh, reanalysis. All this. Uh, these uh, products are used uh, to develop this uh, operational service, providing uh, risk indicators and the consequences of uh, human activities. And this um, kind of uh, resulting products are directed towards fishing and aquaculture uh, or uh, businesses that are or, or organizations that are implementing a maritime special planning directive and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which are European framework uh, in order to protect the ocean environment. The last point uh, is that this uh, service has been uh, developed uh, for maritime safety because the main part of uh, this application is, uh, is made of um, forecast of uh, waves and uh, analysis uh, of uh, einkast waves and uh, extreme uh, statistics as you can see the platform is uh, as the two plot here and i'm going to show you uh, the a live demonstration of the platform so to be short, uh, if I'm going back to the main menu, here you have access to several uh, variables from waves to ice uh, and to temperatures. You have also uh, access to indicators of noise uh, developed by uh, quiet oceans. I'm going to focus on waves and ice uh, as novelties have developed this part. If you go to waves, you have two types of products uh, or you can have statistics. So you are you can have monthly mean uh, maps of significant wave height or period, and you can change the month of the year you want to display the map of. Uh, and you have also uh, forecasts. They are not available uh, uh, now because the the service have been closed, but. This uh, service uh, used to 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 forecast uh, uh, significant wave heights uh, of uh, of waves. If we come back to statistics, uh, we have also access to um, extreme analysis on some uh, particular dots. 
<laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, for example, if I click on a specific dots, so some statistics have been computed on uh, particular points. So you have here time series with minimum, maximum, and mean uh, values. You have also access to wave roses uh, to have an overview of the uh, the distribution of the directions of the waves uh, during 20 years between uh, 1990 uh, and uh, 2015, I think. So uh, 25 years, sorry. Uh, here, you have also access to return level uh, tables. So we are analyzing uh, 25 years of data and we are uh, extracting uh, return periods. And you have also access to different tables of uh, occurrences uh, of uh, significant wave heights uh, uh, per month and here per years. So you have a, an overview of the distribution of the, the waves uh, during these uh, 25 years. Uh, moreover, you have also access to non-accidents uh, tables. So it is working uh, as uh, occurrences, but we are just giving some thresholds so we can have access to the percentage of uh, the total number of waves during 25 years that have been uh, uh, below uh, a certain uh, threshold, like 1.5 meters here for each month and the, the cumulative uh, year. And you have also uh, this kind of information uh, for directions. So I'm coming back to my presentation. Uh, so as I said before, you have access to two types of information, statistics and forecast. And all this uh, information and all this data have been uh, computed using Copernicus Marine Service products of WAVES mainly uh, for free. And we have used this uh, data to, to force our uh, downscaling models of, uh, of sea wave uh, on forecast uh, services. And uh, for the, we have used the reanalysis model of waves to, to compute statistics and uh, extract uh, extreme values. So all this information are useful for uh, maritime safety, aquaculture, and uh, transports on uh, the Arctic region, because the, there are regions where there are no, not a lot of information about um, of waves and uh, sea ice. So uh, we have been uh, doing this, uh, this platform uh, in, the, in the framework of uh, a user up uptake uh, in uh, 2018. So on the forecast uh, services, you have also uh, a noise emission uh, forecast that can be done. Uh, you can define uh, a zone in uh, along the Norwegian coast and uh, decide uh, which kind of uh, categories you want to uh, simulate. For example, a uh, navigation. And uh, you can, uh, using several models, uh, make a, a simulation of uh, noise prediction in, uh, in a particular zone. Uh, that was a short uh, introduction to this uh, Arctic uh, service, which uh, what which we have been doing uh, with uh, Copernicus Marine Service uh, products. So, if you have any question about uh, this service, uh, do not hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Etienne. I don't think we've had some questions on your presentation. No. No, not for the moment, but don't hesitate to keep your question for the breakout room. Uh, you uh, you will have the opportunity to meet uh, Lasse and uh, Etienne in the in a breakout breakout room uh, dedicated to user testimonies. So we can continue. Uh, 
our workshop. It's time to introduce Cédric Jordan, the user support manager uh, at Market Ocean International. He will present you the user corner and e-learning material available on the Copernicus Mine website. Cédric? Yes. Okay, I give you the floor. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon, I'm, so I'm Cedric from uh, the Copernicus uh, Marine Service User Support. And I will give you a short presentation of the user corner. It's an area dedicated uh, to users, which contains useful links to make the best use of our, of our uh, products and uh, services. So to, uh, to reach the user corner, you should see my, uh, the website of the, of the Copernicus Marine Service. At the top right here, you can follow this link to the corner. And you will find several subsections. And the first one to visit is the get it started one. In this, uh, in this page, you will find a sum up of the, uh, of the offer. And below, you will find a, a path, a operational path to, uh, to, to have uh, several uh, links, to have uh, different videos, etc. to to have uh, to, to, to better um, manage our product and services. So this important is, uh, it's important to visit this page uh, firstly to, uh, to have better knowledge of the, the services available. So I go back to the user corner. The second section is a really, really important section because it, it is the, the help center. You will find in this section 150 uh, articles about download, about products, about everything. In fact, you can search using the, the search area with the keywords. For example, I click, I type informed. You will understand later because now I can show how to be informed of operational events on product and services. I click, I click on the title and I reach the, the article with the timetable and with a lot of uh, useful information here for this case to be informed of uh, operational events. You will, in the help center, you will find different collection depending on the subject, download, about the platform, the data, etc. So this is, uh, this, this tool is really, really interesting. The third uh, section is the user notification service. In this section, all the operational events are listed in four uh, categories. So general, improvement, incident, maintenance. So for example, I click on maintenance. You can sort using the product source, the region, the parameter, et cetera, or keyword, and you can create your own RSS feed. And that's why I presented before the, the, the article about the how to be informed because following this article you will be you will subscribe to a specific rss feed and you will be informed automatically if for example this product your product is impacted so it's important it's uh, important to use this uh, rss feed uh, feature i come back to the user corner ne the, the the next uh, user learning services the section three is about the user learning services here you will find information about all the, the training and workshop, past and future. For example, if I uh, go back to the all training session, I uh, find the, the, the information about the Arctic session, Arctic, uh, the workshop. <clears throat> In the section e-learning materials, here you will find Every, any materials about the, the training, so notebooks, scripts, etc. So you will have uh, more information in the dedicated bracket room in a few minutes with uh, Fabrice. Here you can sort by level, beginner, intermediate, or advanced, subject, a tool, if Python, GIS, etc. So this uh, section of the other ones are, is uh, really uh, interesting. Go back to the other corner. The product quality, 
in this uh, dedicated dashboard to, to quality, you will uh, you can sort by area. You can as well sort by the color of the ocean, so blue for physical, green for biochemical, and white for the sea ice. And you will uh, find generic information, the quality of the products and parameters. So I'll let you discover this uh, this dashboard because it's quite uh, it's quite complete. So I come back to the your the corner. If you follow the link to the roadmap, you will uh, you will find information about the the future of the upcoming changes at middle at uh, not a short term but medium term. Because if you have info, if you need information about the changes for a short term, you have to. Uh, this information is available on the section improvement of the user notification service we saw before. So here we saw that in July 2022, these products, for example, will be impacted with an automatic with an extension of uh, of the temporary coverage. I click on the title and I have more information about the the change. The get, get inspired section. So as you saw just before with Lass and uh, Etienne, here you will find as well ex examples of the application of the um, how to use our products, the Copernicus Marine Service products. Same, we can sort on the on the region. You can you can sort on on the on the country. Sorry, on the market, a blue market. And you click on the, for example, I click on the first one, I click on the, the section, and I have the, the description of the, the application, the product use, etc. So this, uh, this section, use cases, so get inspired, it's, uh, it's important to, to have examples of the use of our, of our products. I come back to the other corner only. The collaborative forum. So we are going. We are on the process to to change this forum that I will not show you because uh, it's not really active uh, for the moment. Though, but it will be uh, soon. So it will, uh, the the link will be available in the user corner to log in and register. So it's important to note that you need to be registered if you want to download data only. If you if you, if you want to view data. If you want to uh, to access to the use cases, etc., you don't need to be registered. So to register, it's uh, it's easy. You just have to fill in some some fields: first name, last name, email, the country, your kind of organization, the name and the website of your organization, and you have to choose uh, blue markets. And you accept the term and condition and privacy policy, and you create your account. So the activation is automatic. You will receive uh, an email to confirm your email. So maybe uh, please check your, your spams and your account will be created. Come back to the other corner. The FAQ, FAQ section. In fact, it was the, 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 the before the center, the section was used for technical uh, articles. But now it, it's used for a general question. The service commitment and license. You, we have obligations to uh, on the, about the, the time to answer, time we take to answer users. So everything is written in this uh, is it contract in case. In fact, so you, you will have this information here. And the last section is a contact us form to contact the user support. You just have to uh, to give your name. The, the, the subject of your uh, question, your request, and you add uh, a free text, a free text file if you want, and you can submit your, uh, the form to the user support. And there is another mean to, uh, to contact your support. Yeah, at, the, at the, the bottom right of the, the, the screen, you can click on the, the icon. So here it's, it's, it's in French because my brother is French, but... There is firstly a bridge to the app center. You can you click on the area, the free text area. I can uh, follow. I can uh, search uh, an article. I click here and maybe yes, here is the article. 
And if you don't find the answer among the, the 150 articles, you can contact us and you will meet Elena or Chloe or Alexi or Martin or David, and they will answer you as soon as possible. So in a few minutes as written here. So the, the team is, uh, it's not because it's my team, but the team is really uh, efficient. So don't hesitate to contact us and don't hesitate to, uh, to check the Web Center because it, it's, uh, it is really, really, really useful. So that's uh, all for me. So many thanks for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Cédric. Uh, I think we don't have question for you at the moment, but uh, you will be uh, available for questions during the breakout rooms. Uh, and I will be in charge of a breakout room dedicated to e-learning materials. So if you have questions on this topic, don't hesitate to come uh, and meet me. Uh, so now, it's uh, to Ergan uh, to present the uh, program of the um, session of tomorrow about uh, the practical session. Thank you, Fabrice. Um, so indeed, I'm going to present you a short teaser of tomorrow's program. So as Fabrice said, it's going to be a session with practical exercises on Python, um, on MyOceanViewer, and on QGIS. Um, yes. So um, for QGIS and Python, we're go we, we, we have developed, sorry, two exercises, one dedicated to beginners and one dedicated to intermediate level users. So here is um, an overview of what we do in the, the Jupyter notebook dedicated to beginners. So we learn how to access the Copernican Marine Service products. Um, as it has been said before, these products are NetCDF files, so we will learn how to use such files within Python. And we're going to create uh, some maps and plots to visualize the data. So here are some examples of the figures uh, we will make in the first uh, notebook. Um, the second notebook, um, so the one dedicated to intermediate level users, will cover a real case scenario, which is the thermohaline circulation in the Arctic Ocean, and we're going to monitor its evolution in the frame of climate change. So um, this is, again, these are some examples of the, the figures we're going to do to monitor these changes. Uh, you're going to have um, a presentation of the My Ocean Viewer. So uh, it's a web page in which you can visualize the products um, interactively. So it's very, very useful. Um, so just like Python for QGIS, you will have two um, exercises, one for beginners. So again, you will learn how to access the Copernicus Marine Service products, how to install QGIS and uh, the plugin NetCDF to QGIS, um, which is used to load NetCDF files within QGIS. And you will learn how to create maps and animations. So here are some of the, um, the figures that you're going to learn to produce with the first exercise in QGIS. And finally, the last exercise, so dedicated to advanced level users, um, it will analyze the Arctic sea ice extent, and you're also going to extract sea ice thickness on several points uh, over the Arctic. So uh, this is a comparison of the, of the sea ice extent. So this is an example of what you're going to do um, in, in the second QGIS exercise. So that's it for the, um, the program of tomorrow. I hope uh, the subjects I've presented to you will interest you, and I hope you'll join us tomorrow. And that's it for, for me. And so now it's time uh, to go in the breakout room if, we, if you have uh, some minutes to, to share with the, uh, the, the experts and you want to ask your question or discuss about some blocking points you may have with the products or to understand 
uh, better the, the products. Don't hesitate to move uh, in the different breakout rooms. So we will have a breakout rooms dedicated on model products with Laurent and Ergan. Uh, breakout room with uh, uh, on satellite products with uh, Cecile and Simon. Uh, the breakout room for in situ observations with Vidar, uh, moderate, moderated by Cedric, and uh, the breakout room for user on user testimonies, sorry, with Lasse and Etienne. And I will welcome you in the breakout room dedicated to uh, training material. So. so, this is the end. We can conclude. <laughs> yes. So thank you to uh, all the participants uh, for joining us. And uh, thank you to the experts who prepared the presentation, the user testimonies also. Um, and thank you, Vincent, thank at you. the Technique. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you, Ergan, for your, the moderation. <laughs> Thank you, Fabrice. So tomorrow, uh, which time? Three. It's two thirty p.m. Two thirty. Two thirty p.m. Mm. Uh, for the the second part of the workshop dedicated to practical session. And uh, I put in the chat as well the link to the material we developed for the Arctic training. So you will find the two tutorials video from QGIS and uh, Jupyter Notebooks and two other, two other uh, demonstrations will be done by Ergen and Etienne tomorrow for the practice session. So we are waiting for you tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. CEST for the continuation of this workshop. Ergen, do you want to add something? Um, no, that's fine with me. Um, I really hope you'll be there tomorrow. And I can't wait to, to show you the practical exercises. See you tomorrow. So bye. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.